Hello everyone and welcome to Channel 18 TV News. I'm Don Julian and in the news, Sulphur Springs Police Department released the following on Tuesday morning uh, regarding a shooting at a local apartment complex. Sulphur Springs Police Department has identified a suspect in the February 5th uh, shooting incident at Spring Valley Apartments in the 800 block of Fuller Street. In the course of the investigation, Detective Jason Renault determined that Brandon Clayton Souls was involved in the shooting incident and a warrant has been issued for Souls' arrest for aggravated assault with a deadly weapon. Souls has an address in the Mineola, Texas area. And anyone with information as to Soul's location is asked to please call Detective Renault at 903-439-3832. And if you wish to remain anonymous, call Crime Stoppers 903-885-2020 with your information. An 18-year-old was reportedly found dead on FM 1567 East in Hopkins County in what is believed to be an accident while working under a vehicle, according to Hopkins County Sheriff's officers. Uh, the teen's girlfriend reportedly found him at the FM 1567 East residence. Authorities uh, were contacted at 2.06 p.m. Monday, and sheriff's officers responded. Teen was reported to be deceased. Based on initial investigation, the teen is believed to have been working underneath his vehicle when the jack slipped, uh, and uh, the teen is believed... Uh, uh, and uh, Jack slipped, crushing him, according to Hopkins County Sheriff's officers. Teen has been identified by authorities as 18-year-old Daryl Puckett of Sulphur Springs. Autopsy has been ordered as is standard procedure, according to Precinct 1 J.P. B.J. Tier. At the close of filing, Yantis Independent School District uh, School Board has four candidates filing for two seats on the school board. Incumbents Jennifer McKeever and Melissa Stevens are challenged by Teresa Sturette and uh, Jennifer Larkin for their seats on the school board. Voters within the Yantis ISD will be asked to select up to two candidates to serve for full three-year terms on the school board. The two candidates receiving the most votes will be elected to the school board. Chance to find out more about Texas A&M Commerce and the Texas A&M University System. We have a guest with us this morning. Would you please introduce yourself to our listening audience? Yes, happy to. Uh, James Hallmark, and I'm the Vice Chancellor for Academic Affairs with the A&M System. So I'm located in College Station working in the system offices, working with the 11 universities in the A&M System. There are many, many things that we'd like to find out, but let me try by asking you just a few. Uh, Texas being so vast geographically and with a booming population, mm -hmm. how many campuses are there? You mentioned 11, but there are like sub campuses as well? Yes, there are, uh, the, w the way the state defines universities, uh, we have 11 universities in the A&M system, but several of those have uh, multiple sites that they teach from. Uh, for example, A&M Commerce teaches up in uh, McKinney. They teach courses in, in Mesquite and some other places in the metropolitan area. Um, A&M Texarkana, which is not too far away, has a program in Paris. Uh, so there are, are various campuses that, uh, they're not officially campuses, but there are locations where our universities teach. And then in addition to that, there are places like A&M Galveston, which has several thousand students, but that is not officially a separate university. It's a branch campus, same idea with with um, uh, McAllen, A&M McAllen, uh, down in the Rio Grande Valley. That's just a branch campus, not a separate mm -hmm. university. So if you added up all those sites, I don't know. <laughs> it's, well, it's, it's many, many sites where we are, we are teaching. Okay. And then in addition to that, the A&M system also leads and operates the uh, Ag Extension Service, AgriLife Extension Service, and that's in every county in the state. Yes. So if you, you, you put all those together, we say that we have a, a presence in every county in the state of Texas, and it's true we have a presence in every county. And is there a number at hand 
that how many students are mm -hmm. currently enrolled in all these campuses? Uh, it's about 165,000. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. So our, our total, and that would have been a fall enrollment number in the spring, it's always okay. a little bit lower. Uh, but so it's probably in the around 160, 162 as we speak right now. But 165 it was our number. Uh, 165,000 was our number from this past fall, and uh, it has had a steady increase uh, each year for a number of years. Uh, it was about 150,000 as recently as five or six years ago. So uh, we have more and more students needing educational opportunities in Texas, mm -hmm. and we are aggressive in trying to provide those opportunities for them. Well, in all these locations and with all these students, would you share your vision for the system, the Texas A&M system? This is actually good timing uh, for that kind of question because uh, we work very closely in my office with our regents. So each university system in Texas has a set of regents, nine regents that are okay. appointed by the governor. And um, our regents right now are involved in a strategic planning process. Uh, we did a strategic plan for the regents four years ago, and uh, this past summer the regents looked at that and said, wow, we did a great job four years ago, but it's time to tweak it. So we're not, it's not a complete redo, but, a, but an update. And so we're, we're currently in the middle of those kinds of conversations. I had an extensive meeting down in Laredo be two weeks ago now, uh, where we spent all day with the regents and consultants uh, discussing uh, where, is the, where, is the, where our universities are going from here. And, and, and I think the first imperative, there's, there's uh, uh, six imperatives that our, our regents currently uh, work on. If you asked me to list them all, I probably couldn't do it. But the, <laughs> the first one uh, is basically saying that every qualified student in Texas who wants uh, a, a higher education degree will find a pathway within the A&M system. Okay. There's some place for everybody. And, and what does that ex exactly mean, I think, is an important thing for people like me to grapple with is that how do I make that opportunity for that that 18 year old in Sulphur Springs who's about to graduate this May uh, to find a pathway to his or her future through the A&M system uh, what does it mean for that 40 year old who is thinking um, you know what I've been okay at what I'm doing for now or maybe I just don't like my current job and I want to go back and do something else what what can we do to, to to reach out to those students or for the millions and millions of Texas who have what we call some college no degree meaning they they picked up a few hours somewhere the way or they started somewhere along the way but for whatever reason never finished and, and what can we do to reach out to those students or those potential students and 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 share, share a pathway so I think that first imperative uh, is directly germane to your question of what can we do in the A&M system to make sure there's pathways for everybody and, and I, I use the word qualified on purpose because we are not open admission. So okay. that by, by uh, definition in the state of Texas, community colleges provide more opportunities than the four-year universities in terms of, of uh, giving everybody a chance. Um, but, but for all the qualified students, of which there are millions, um, where can we find a pathway within the A&M system? And that, that's part of the vision that we're, that we're focusing on right now. And so that includes uh, how do we assure that there's a smooth transition from high school to our universities? Um, uh, currently, um, the um, uh, endorsements that, that the public schools have uh, and the degree programs, you know, is that the right pathway for how we can best assure that that student goes directly from your high school here to A&M Commerce or to College Station or Tarleton or wherever they might go? Uh, is there anything that we can be doing in working with the public schools to um, make sure that pathway is smoother? Uh, as I mentioned, the hypothetical 40-year-old or 50-year-old or whatever, what is it that that person needs in terms of assistance to make that transition back to learning? And what does learning look like for that person? Is it a 16-week semester? Is it a five-week semester? Is it online modules? Is it weekend classes with some online stuff mixed in? You know, what is it? What is the path that allows you to seek uh, your degree or certification yeah, within the AM system? So that's part of what we're all working on. You may have alluded to this, but the decisions on how things need to be altered or, or changed for various reasons for the students, uh, who makes those decisions and who comes up with the ideas? for uh, new classes to offer and et cetera? The ideas probably come from, be most accurate to say they come from a myriad of, of mm -hmm. places. Um, 
I had a guy from Galveston reach out to me a month or two ago about something called eSports. You ever heard of eSports? Me either. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's huge, oh. okay? Um, and it, it's basically gaming, so the online gaming that, that uh, uh, in my case, my son-in-law does it a lot, okay? You know, they, they sit in front of computer screens and play games and whatnot with people in other places. And that is completely foreign to me. I would never come up with eSports as a possibility. Um, so this, this fellow who spoke to me from Galveston, he's a high school, science, uh, high school computer science teacher at uh, Ball High School in Galveston. And, and he was telling me about how this is such an enormous activity growing. So I started asking around on my campuses and found out that all of our universities, including A&M Commerce, have club sports and activities mm -hmm. where their students are engaging in this and are seeking for ways by which it would grow and um, um, engaging with the computer science faculty in terms of degree programs. Well, my, the reason I provide that example is I think it's illustrative of I never would have come up with that. <laughs> I didn't even know it existed. And yet it is a, a, it is a future. It, there's, there's something amazing going on here that these students, once they get through these programs, are going to be inventing the next amazing app that you can't live without or uh, programming solutions to problems that we right now think of are unsolvable. And, and it's, it's, it's a, a, an academic program and a co-curricular program <clears throat> that I would never capture but someone out there did. And so what we want all over all of our campuses to have that that open environment where those ideas are, are emerging. And and so certainly a, a president may have a great idea. Um, more likely it's gonna be on a campus, it's gonna be the faculty and the students, but also the community out there who aren't even one of our faculty or students, but they know of something, have these ideas. So, you know, an idea comes along, we vet it, we we ask the question. Is there a demand for this? Is there a market for individuals who would be graduating with this degree? Uh, and uh, what are the costs associated with it? Uh, because of accreditation issues, we have to worry about who's gonna teach these things and make sure that we follow all the rules. And through that study, through that analysis, we ask the question, is this something that my university should do? And if so, then it goes through a, a, a formal review process that's required by state law. Um, that goes all the way up into my office and all the way to the Board of Regents, such that at the end of that process, which doesn't take as long as I made it sound, <laughs> at the end of that process, <clears throat> you know, fall of 2020, A&M Commerce has, boom, this mm -hmm. degree and is now offering that degree for its students. And so um, it, I think the real, the key to all of that long discussion uh, is it comes from everywhere. And, and we just have to make sure we keep our um, minds receptive to to where those ideas would come from. Um, you asked a two-part question. I don't remember what the first part was, though, so. Well, uh, let us switch to this. Okay. I would like to ask you about challenges that face higher education in our state, but I also, after that, want to ask you more about our Commerce Campus. Okay. Um, I think in terms of talking about uh, challenges in the state, it, it's, it's important to talk about challenges nationally also because certainly that uh, impacts the state. Um, sometimes I, I kid that Texas um, acts as though it's not part of the rest of the country, but it is and is impacted by uh, the culture and that's going on across the country. Uh, probably the biggest cultural concern we have in terms of a challenge is, um, is a growing perception that there isn't a value in higher education. Um, and and it's, it's capturing a tremendous amount of interest in, in my circles uh, nationally right now of um, uh, this, this, this comment, this assumption that you, know, you don't need to go to college. Um, it's not worth it. And so, and it's fed by a story that isn't accurate. Um, so if you asked a random person on the streets here in Sulphur Spring, what is the average student debt when somebody graduates, mm -hmm. they might tell you $200,000 or something because they see it on the news all the time. And those are actually outliers. Those aren't common. Those are quite rare when you have those kinds of debt levels. Um, the, uh, you know, that's somebody who made some foolish choices and or you know maybe it's their law school debt or their medical school debt or something like that or went to a for-profit kind of entity that really gouged them. Um, the average student who graduates from A&M Commerce, their debt is about $25,000. Okay. 
guy, uh, actually the average student who graduates with debt from commerce is $25,000. Okay. We track that. And that doesn't even average in all those students who graduate with no debt. So we, we keep track of that as well, of what those percentages are. And so, you know, you think about it, uh, if your degree isn't worth the price of a relatively inexpensive mid-sized car, you know, then we really made a mistake somewhere along the way in, in, uh, in providing that education. And, and undoubtedly, there are students who would say, no, nah, it wasn't worth it at our universities. But, but we try to keep, we are very conscious of keeping our prices as competitive and yes. as low as possible at all of our A&M system universities. And when you look at the price breakdown across the state of Texas, uh, A&M system universities, including the flagship, which theoretically would be very, very expensive, is way down the list of oh. institutional cost in the state of Texas. Uh, our, our regents are very adamant about trying to keep that price down. And our average debt for most of our institutions is below the national average. We do have two that are above the national average. Um, but, okay, so, so but, that, but that national conversation of, eh, it's not worth it, just, you know, go pick up a skill or, or something yeah. like that. And, and I, I don't want to in any way disparage uh, the technical trades. Uh, I live in Texas. When the when summer's here and my air conditioner quits, there is <coughs> nobody on the planet more important to me than the uh, HVAC guy. Um, but but really, in terms of looking at the future of our country and the future of Texas, uh, the uh, growth and development in in science and the arts and humanities is essential for our continued um, thriving uh, as a society and culture. Uh, educating great teachers is essential, right. is essential to the future of our country. And so, you know, uh, but the value of education is being questioned right now okay. across the country, and, and that's something that's, that is of great concern to us. Uh, locally, com coming down more, more, more uh, locally to Texas anyway, um, we have a, a significant increase in the number of um, um, number of individuals who are needing higher education who perhaps are not coming from environments where that was uh, part of their normal course of history. So, so we're talking about first generation, um, what we call first generation students. So students whose parents didn't have any exposure to college. And uh, that's great. Uh, let's get them into college. You know, let's, uh, let's work with them. But that creates um, uh, an additional layer of um, stress or opportunity, however you want to define it, in terms of the institution working with that person. So just to give you an example, I, you know, a student who comes in and we start talking about financial aid and their need to fill out the forms, they don't, their parents don't have any exposure to that. They don't know what that means. They don't know that they need to fill this out by excess because they didn't go through it before. Mm -hmm. right. And so um, our, our campuses have to be very proactive in working with the these individuals to help them through this process because unfortunately our bureaucracy um, has created a rather complex path. Mm -hmm. So one of the challenges that our campuses have is what is it, what about this path is unnecessary and what is it that we have to do in order to stay legal? Yeah. So, um, but, but there, there are a growing number in Texas of, uh, of individuals who are um, first generation and being able to reach out to them and work with them. So there are many challenges, but I'll leave it at that for now. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> our Texas a our Texas A&M Commerce mm -hmm. has a very rich history. It was mm -hmm. once a teacher's college right. and lots of proud alumni of ETSU mm -hmm. around these parts. Old ET. I've heard that <laughs> phrase before. <laughs> <clears throat> well, and the studies uh, being expanded on our campus and actually I think Texas A&M is championing the cause of greater diversity, mm -hmm. equality, inclusion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. Now, the the, um, the right now, in fact, I'm here because of a summit we're having here at A okay. and M Commerce on diversity, equity, and inclusion. And um, um, you know that really is a a commitment that everybody counts. Uh, every person it doesn't matter what their background is where they come from if they're here we want to provide a pathway for their education and uh, it really is tied in well with the the region's first imperative that i mentioned a few minutes ago of creating a pathway providing a pathway for everybody and historically that has not been true in our country there have been individuals who were excluded 
for whatever reason, and it varies from location to location who those individuals might be. Um, and and we're, what we're seeking to do um, in the A&M system is provide a culture and environment where everybody is welcome, everyone is included, everyone has that opportunity to pursue that degree. And so, you know, just tying that into the equity and uh, diversity, equity, inclusion conference that we have going on right now at Commerce. And this particular Commerce has, rep excuse me, this particular conference has representatives from all of our universities. And uh, they're meeting right now as we speak, in fact, and talking about how they can work together toward that goal of assuring that our campuses are open to everyone. I recently met a man who is involved with the Agriculture Department mm -hmm. of Texas A&M Commerce, mm -hmm. and that um, department is being expanded as well. Yes. You know, the, uh, um, the A and A&M <laughs> <laughs> yes. uh, means nothing, actually. Uh, technically, it, the A&M uh, legally was, uh, doesn't mean anything anymore, but uh, its origins, of course, is agriculture, agriculture and mechanical. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, and and A&M Commerce has a long history in its ag program, um, but it, it has opportunity to do considerably more. And under the more recent leadership, that has been pushed. Uh, and I think there's some real interesting opportunities there in agriculture that um, we haven't always thought about and really didn't necessarily exist until technology came along. But, you know, uh, people in the ag industry now are not just sitting on a tractor, you know. Uh, there's tremendous amount of um, uh, agribusiness involved. Um, nutrition is such a huge issue right now. And so a, a, a farmer or a rancher can't just be concerned about raising his or her cattle or, or, or planting his or her crops. They've got to be thinking of this um, new market where the people who are buying these products are very interested in the, um, what is it, the farm to table movement, I right. believe is what it's called. So, you know, very interested in the nutritional components that we didn't pay attention to as much 10 years ago or 15, 20 years ago. And so uh, w one of the things that we've, we, uh, when we were meeting with the producers, uh, the pr associations, those, so that's the cattlemen and the cotton producers and you know all those different entities, um, probably about two years ago in a meeting in Austin, um, one of the things that one of the leaders of one of those producers said to our ag dean at A&M, at A&M College Station was, we know how to grow this stuff. What we don't know how to do, what we need some help with, is understanding the uh, the current cultural environment and how we can um, uh, compete in an in an environment that is changing dramatically in terms of the demand for our products. You know, and I think beef is an easy example for that. Is that um, 20 years ago, not many people, not as many people, were questioning the value of beef. And now we have battles going on, and you know, Burger King sells a, I don't know what it's called, a, a un, un beef witch or whatever it's called, no. you know, and um, you know, and and that's I'm not not opposed to that. I'm just saying that that our our uh, people in the agriculture industry have to be aware of and understand how to compete in that environment. Um, urban agriculture is becoming a huge issue, so our, our challenge or opportunity. Mm -hmm. So commerce, you you folks aren't are not far outside of a rather large urban area. And the, uh, the Dallas area has, you fly over it, you see little farms. It's, not, it's more than gardens, it's little mm -hmm. farms in people's backyards like you never saw before. Or maybe like you haven't seen recently. Okay. I think our, our parents and grandparents did that more commonly. Large gardens that are really more than gardens, but farms. Um, you have hydroponics where uh, they're doing it indoors in their backyards. Uh, there's, there's, uh, the ag industry is changing dramatically, and I'm real pleased that, that commerce is, is diving into, A&M Commerce is diving into that game and wanting to be a, a major player in it, and we're supporting that. Well, from your talk, I can tell that consumerism is part, partly uh, governed by social and cultural changes mm -hmm. that are taking place really fast. Mm -hmm. um, it seemed as if the generation before, you know, they grew up on organic right. foods that they grew themselves, right. but quickly the generations are changing to where everyone looks at that as a goal. I, I believe that's uh, that, that's really an accurate statement. That um, that when our, our grandparents just generically saying that organic was what they were. You know, <laughs> this was this was called life. This wasn't called organic. Um, and and we went through a stage where we valued as a culture 
processed and you know that was uh, that was a selling point that this wasn't like that what your grandma got from the right. garden we processed these green beans you know and now that's not what anybody wants to buy now what people want to buy is is that same thing grandma had and uh and that's a shift in the industry and it's a shift that they will adjust to well um but what the academic community is charged with doing is helping everybody have the facts it's not to push or lead an initiative one way or the other but to make sure that there's real information and real facts and real knowledge out there for the individuals in that industry to make the choices and, and adjust accordingly well there are many changes and more to come i uh, thank you for uh, sharing with us a, a very broad view of what Texas A&M University system does and, and will strive to do. Mm -hmm. but I would like to ask you your personal pride in the Texas A&M University system. Uh, we do a really good job. I think <laughs> you you do. Um, I'm very proud of the fact that wherever I go in the United States, and I mean this literally, and whatever shirt I'm wearing, because I've got Commerce polos and I've got uh, West Texas polos, I'm going to run into somebody who says, wow, uh, are you from A&M Commerce? Well, no, but it's a school I work with. Oh, yeah, yeah. My brother went there, or I went there, or my mom t went there. You know, I mean, there's, 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 that, there, there's a level of pride there. And, and I, I really do take pride in that, that uh, I've never had anybody approach me. And maybe they run away when they see my shirt if they're of this mindset and say, oh, I hate that school, you know, or, or uh, my mom went there and had a bad experience or, you know, I've never had that. And that really is a, a point of pride that I can wear a shirt from any of our institutions and know that there are thousands of people out there, hundreds of thousands of people out there who have pod positive experiences in some way with our university. I, I, I think probably the biggest point of pride, though, is is our universe, our a and system universities, I'll put them up against anybody on the planet for having a big heart. Um, we just do so many things that are beyond the, the norm for what universities do. A, a quick example, um, uh, after Hurricane Harvey, uh, all kinds of need out there. And we had two universities that were just completely decimated by those, a and Corpus Christi and a and Kingsville, uh, right down there where the, where the storm hit. Uh, Galveston was beat up. Um, Prairie View had was uh, a huge chunk of Prairie View A&M students live in the Houston area that was so flooded because it was the uh, Prairie View is an HBCU, largely black institution, and and draws very well from the the black uh, community in Houston, and the outpouring of support from our campuses to those individuals was amazing. Um, A&M Commerce took counseling students and counseling faculty down there. Uh, to work with individuals for weeks on time. The football team from A&M Commerce went down there and cleared debris, you know. That, that big heart, that doesn't happen everywhere. You know, and I know people do good things everywhere, but, but there's a level of, of big heartedness. And as a result of that, um, uh, the, uh, the, the regents um, are now allocating $3 million a year. $3 million is, is a lot of money in my, my world. <laughs> $3 million a year that flows through my office that does nothing but help students who have faced an unexpected tragedy. And it could be anything from uh, your car breaks down and I don't know how I'm gonna get to class. Okay, I need 600 bucks for a new whatever, you know, to, to fix my car. Uh, and I don't come from a family where I've got 600 bucks that I could just put it on a credit card. And so without that, I'm not gonna be able to go to school. Okay, let's get that car fixed. And it's not a loan. You know, it is, we're fixing your car. Um, <clears throat> I've had so many of those things flow through my office and I don't have to, I don't see all of them because obviously with $3 million, it's, it's a lot of, uh, of paperwork and a lot of people making sure this is done well. But, you know, uh, uh, just thinking of instances that have popped up on my horizon, um, a, a student who otherwise was financially stable, but his dad died in a car accident and suddenly the family has no income. What kind of assistance do we need to do? Because the feds don't catch up with that for a couple of years, just given the way the, 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 the financial aid process works. What do we need to do to bridge that gap? so that student can continue pursuing his or her degree, his degree in this case. But that, that kind of heart um, is something that I'm, I'm real proud of what the A&M system does, is the students are not just students. They're part of our family, and when there's needs out there, uh, people look out for those individuals. And I, I think that's something to be very proud of. Well, thank you for sharing that pride with us and for taking some time out of your busy schedule coming to the summit in uh, Texas A&M Commerce this week. And thank you for sharing with our listeners and viewers. Well, thank you. Thank you for inviting me and I enjoyed visiting with you. 
The weekend arrest of 50-year-old Rodney Lee Harrison was the result of a joint investigation by the Sulphur Springs Police Department, Hopkins County Sheriff's Office investigators in uh, two uh, allegations of sex crimes involving two children. Child Protective Services and uh, McKinney Police Department also aided in the case, according to the Sulphur Springs Police. Uh, Sulphur Springs uh, Police Detective Sergeant David Gilmore said Tuesday uh, the man was on the run for seven days before McKinney Police Department took him into custody Friday at an apartment in McKinney. Local law enforcement officials were first contacted in the early morning hours of February 2nd regarding the alleged sexual abuse of an 11-year-old child. During that investigation, officials received information alleging the youth had been sexually abused multiple times over a period of a year and a half to two years. The, off the offenses were alleged to have occurred in both Sulphur Springs as well as in the Picton area. Officials sought and obtained a warrant on February 7th for Harrison's arrest for continuous sexual abuse of a child, first degree felony offense, with a punishment range of 25 to 99 years or life in prison if a defendant is convicted, according to Detective Gilmore. Through the course of investigation, Harrison was also accused of one count of indecency uh, with another child, nine years old, by sexual contact. Another warrant was sought and obtained for Harrison's arrest on that second-degree felony charge on February 11th, according to police uh, uh, detectives. Rodney Lee Harrison was transported later Friday from the Collin County Jail to Hopkins County Jail, and he remained there Tuesday uh, in Hopkins County Jail in lieu of $150,000 bond on the continuous sexual abuse of a child charge and $100,000 bond on indecency with a child charge. In sports, what seemed like a long rebuilding year for the Lady Cats basketball team ended Monday with a bi-district loss to Jacksonville 55-26 at Tyler Junior College. It's the second year in a row that the Maidens ended the Lady Cats season. The Lady Cats came into, their, uh, into the game as their district's uh, number four seed, and uh, Jacksonville was the district 16-5A champ with a perfect 14-0 district mark. The Maidens are ranked number 13 in Class 5A, and they improved their season record to 24-8. The Lady Cats ended the year with a record of 11-24. They were 3-7 in district play. The Lady Cats struggled all season after losing four starters off of last year's team, and then injuries came. Despite all of this, the Lady Cats made their way into the playoffs, and Lady Cats coach Brittany Tisdale said it was a big deal to earn a playoff spot and was good experience for her young team. The Lady Cats will lose only two seniors off of their playoff roster of 10 players. That would be Colbria Harrison and the versatile Kate Womack. Monday night, a junior Nyla Lindley led the Lady Cats with 11 points. Senior Kate Womack, freshman Kenzie Willis, and sophomore Hannah Cordell all scored four points. Freshman Addison Wall had three points. Monday evening, the Lady Cats quickly fell into a hole against Jacksonville, and they trailed 25 to four after one quarter. After that, the Lady Cats played the Maidens pretty close. Jacksonville only outscored the Lady Cats seven to five in the second quarter, 15 to 10 in, in, in the third quarter, and eight to seven in the fourth quarter. Jacksonville had four players in double figures led by Tamia Tucker with 15 points. In Hopkins County basketball on uh, Monday night, the Sulphur Bluff Lady Bears won a bi-district game against Miller Grove. The Lady Bears led at the half by seven, 29 to 22, and then extended their lead in the second half, winning uh, 58 to 40. Jada Wade had four points, a steal, three rebounds, and an assist. And Wade also did a good job, according to her coach, uh, Zandra Payton. 
of uh, defending one of Miller Grove's best scores. Delina Di Donato had 12 points, 8 rebounds, and 2 assists. Skylar Stanley had 10 points, 12 rebounds, and an assist. And Dorner had 15 points, 2 steals, 5 rebounds, and an assist. Allie Colette had 8 points and 3 rebounds. Tori Rainey had uh, six points, one steal, and two rebounds. Angel Brown had three points, one assist, and and, uh, three rebounds. Lydia Drummond had a rebound. And in the area round, Sulphur Bluff will now play Bryson at Tioga. That'll be Friday at 7 o'clock. Wildcats and Lady Cats powerlifting coach Casey Jeter said a Paris meet last Thursday was one of the best that he's ever been involved with. He said his teams faced some of the best competition in the area, and the Wildcats finished third as a team just points away from the top. In the 114-pound weight class, Austin McCain was third, squatting 180, bench pressing 115, and deadlifting 250 pounds. Coach Jeter said uh, McCain has improved 100 pounds over the last two meets. In the 148-pound weight class, Jesse Carrillo was second. He had a uh, personal record squat of 450 pounds, 285 pounds in deadlift, and totaled 1,185 pounds. Coach Jeter said Carrillo was currently second in the region. In the 181-pound weight class, freshman Matthew Mitchell got fourth place. Coach Jeter said he had uh, personal records in all lifts with 450 pounds in squat, 230 pounds bench press, and 450 pounds deadlift. In the 198-pound weight class, Ryan Carrillo had 485 pounds in the squat, 300 pounds bench press, and 450 pounds in deadlift. George Greenway was second in the 220-pound weight class. He had 670 pounds in the squat, 315 pounds bench pressing, and 560 pounds in deadlift. Sophomore Chad Menard was third in his weight class with 525 pounds in squat, 280 pounds in bench press, and 455 pounds in deadlift. Wildcats junior quarterback Caden Wallace, competing in his first meet, got fifth place to earn points for the Wildcats. Wallace squatted 400 pounds, bench pressed 275, and deadlifted 460. For the Lady Cats, senior Sable Erdmeyer had a 330-pound squat, bench pressed 135, and deadlifted 360. Sophomore Addie Lamb squatted 250 pounds, bench pressed 115 pounds, and deadlifted 250 pounds. Coach Jeter said all of the lifters had at least one personal best. This week, the Lady Cats will be lifting at a commerce meet on Friday. The Wildcats will be lifting in commerce on Saturday. And that's Channel 18 TV News. I'm Don Julian. Thank you for joining me. And so long, everybody.